When my mom's cancer came back a third time, she decided to forego treatment and live her life as much as she could. I don't want to be hooked up to any of that crap anymore. Let's just go out and do stuff, she proclaimed. She started making a list of things she wanted to happen before she finally kicked the bucket. But it wasn't a bucket list. She hated that term. Why would I kick a bucket, Dallas? It's screwy. Makes no sense. Number one on her I'm gonna die soon list was a visit to the motherland. She meant Ireland. A lifelong dream for all of us. But then her list began to trail off and look more like a regular to-do list. At number four, she'd written, buy new couch. Number 10, paint fence. And then number 16, bread, the thick sliced kind from Smart and Final. <laughs> Most of the items on the list seemed easy enough. The problem was my mom loved to talk, or gabbin as she called it, and she was excellent at it. Often when someone stares down cancer and lives to tell about it, at least one personality trait becomes heightened, but usually always the most useless one. Like really getting into volunteering, or believing in crystals, or meth. For my mom, it was the talking. She would talk to everybody. Waitresses, grocery clerks, people walking their dogs, the dogs themselves. She loved dogs. I once watched her walk by a couple at an outside table enjoying lunch, and they had a dog. My mom, as always, would comment, Oh, look at that dog. Oh, Dallas, what a cutie. Then she'd ask the owners if she could say hi to the dog. They, as always, obliged. But this time, my mom had been dealing with some back pain. And after a few seconds of talking to this dog, she pulled up a chair and sat down. She started gabbing with the owners, who didn't really know what to do. And when the waiter walked up, my mom ordered an iced tea. <laughs> this meant... Buying a new couch or buying bread from Smart and Final, where my mom will have to tell every person she sees or dogs why the thick sliced bread is the best bread, was actually going to be a lot harder than just flying to Ireland. <laughs> planning the trip was immediately difficult. My mom wanted to be a part of every inch of planning, but got annoyed that we kept her in the dark due to what my mom called chemo brain. This is where she'd forget something, get frustrated, then blame it on years of chemo, then get mad at us for no reason. It was fun. <laughs> Sometimes I don't remember down from up. It's screwy, she'd laugh and then sigh and then stare off into the abyss, probably thinking about dogs. Before the trip even got started, our stubborn family began arguing lightly, passive-aggressive guilt trips followed by under-the-breath comments and talking behind people's backs. You know, classic Catholic shit. <laughs> Which meant we were definitely ready for Ireland. My mom wanted to do three things on this trip. She wanted to fly first class, she wanted to stay in a castle overnight, and she wanted to kiss the Blarney Stone. As long as the chemo brain and being a family didn't break us first, we'd have the trip of our lives. A couple months later, we landed in Dublin. We met our private tour guide and driver named Mike, who greeted us at baggage claim. He was tall, a bit chubby, with a classic Irish face and very calm demeanor. My mom handed him our bags, like we were the Kennedys or something, and said, I'm going to go get some iced coffee. Oh, you probably won't find that here, Mike said. Really not much iced coffee in Ireland. It's already cold. <laughs> My mom replied with an exhausted, they better have it. I walked my mom to find a little restaurant bar so she could get her drink. When we approached, the nice lady behind the counter asked her what she wanted. Coffee, please. Iced coffee. Oh, we don't have that here, the woman replied. What do you mean, my mom countered. We don't serve that. Never have. My mom turned to me for some backup. She means, like, iced coffee? I'm not good backup. But it pleased my mom, and she turned to the woman awaiting, awaiting a reply. Uh, yes, we don't have that. My mom seemed irrationally upset, like someone who hadn't had their morning coffee. <laughs> so she lashed back. You know, I feel sorry for you. Let's go, Dallas. <laughs> the woman, not wasting a second, yelled back, Well, I feel sorry for Americans. <laughs> it was year one of Donald Trump, so I felt that. I mouthed, I'm sorry. And then we wandered back to Mike and the rest of our small group. Oh, no coffee then, eh? Mike asked. Don't get me started, my mom replied. Yes, Mike, let's not get her started.
You see, my mom was never normally this indignant or stubborn, another trait that was made super post her last fight with cancer. Her quick wit and passive aggressiveness made worse by chemo brain, like the worst version of the Hulk. You wouldn't like me when I'm uncaffeinated. <laughs> we all brushed it off because we were on our way to our first city, Donegal. It's where most of our family was from, and as a surprise to my mom, we were staying three nights there in a converted castle that was now a world-renowned resort. I mean, they had a life-size iron statue of a dragon out front. My mom, extremely tired and caffeine-free, had eyes wider, wider than a kid on Christmas morning. She couldn't believe it, and neither could we. I mean, this place was fucking nice. Sorry, fecking nice. The next morning, no one was awake except me. I'm a natural insomniac, so things like time zones factor little into whether I'm able to sleep or not. I went out to meet Mike, who would quickly learn that waking up early was never going to be in the cards for our family. So we both ate some breakfast together at the resort. I explained to him about my mom's condition. Okay, Mike said. Thanks for telling me. I went through something similar with my mother years ago. A few hours later, everyone except my mom was dredged out of bed, and we made our way to Donegal Town Square to tour Donegal Castle. I really wanted my mom to join us, to see hallways our ancestors were probably put to death in for petty crimes. <laughs> she loved knowing about our family history and heritage, good or bad, but she was just too tired from all the traveling and couldn't make it out of bed. When we got back to the castle, my mom was in the dining hall. She'd somehow convinced someone to give her breakfast for dinner, probably through her subtle and debilitating technique of gabbin. I told her how bummed I was she missed Donegal Castle, but my mom just said, oh, it's fine. I'm in a castle now, and this one has waffles. <laughs> she then went back to sleep for an entire second day. Two days lost, but I'd hoped the rest would do her good. The next day, we arrived in Galway, and my mom was indeed more rested, but now she wanted to take charge of the trip. She tried to check us into her ho our hotel. She couldn't understand the process correctly and started to get upset at the front desk. So she just walked out. This time there was no frustration or space or sigh after the frustration, no chemo brain excuse, just more frustration and then anger and then nothing. We all stood around not knowing what to do, but for the first time I felt myself getting angry about it. To try and boost morale, we went out to eat. Galway is known for incredible cuisine from all over the world, so we went to this award-winning Italian place whose name I couldn't pronounce if you threatened me with death. The staff, chef, food, and menu were all imported from Italy. The waitress, who had a very thick Italian accent, helped us through the menu featuring mostly Italian words and then landed on my mom. Hmm, I don't see it on the menu, <laughs> but I'd love manicotti, my mom said. Uh, we don't have that, the waitress replied. My mom assumed this was a language barrier. <laughs> manicotti! Yes, we don't have that here, the waitress repeated. My mom then replied confidently, well, they have it at Olive Garden. <laughs> we all began to sink into our chairs. The waitress couldn't look more confused. There was a pause. Manakati, my mom announced again. The waitress looked for help. My mom looked for help, so I stepped in. Maybe explain to her what it is, and maybe they have something similar. Well, how do they not know what manicotti is? It's screwy. We all sank further. I know what it is, the waitress replied. My mom then cut her off. Great, I'll take that. <laughs> we don't serve manicotti, the waitress continued. It's an American dish that we don't make here. Well, it's Italian where I come from. <laughs> Manna, my wife stepped in. Do you have anything like manicotti? The waitress replied excitedly, yes. She then explained a dish that was strikingly similar, but a little different to which my mom replied, well, I don't want that. I told my mom I'd order for her and she agreed. I ordered her the dish the waitress suggested, it, it suggested and when it came, my mom said out loud with absolutely no humor involved, see Dallas, I knew they had manicotti. The trip continued to be a heavy mixture of good days and bad nights, or bad nights and good days. We'd have a beautiful time walking through the arts district in Galway. My mom spoiled my daughter with the clotter ring, toys, and clothes, and we even found cold brew. Not iced coffee, but it was close. 
Then the next day, my mom would be too tired to get out of bed. Or we'd have a delicious lunch overlooking the ocean. Then that evening, my mom would realize the things she'd been missing by feeling sick. And then she'd misplace her anger and frustration onto us. Brushing it off became harder and harder. And our bickering and arguing got worse to where it seemed like no one was having a good time. But then, like a college kid who decided to take a year off and go backpacking in Europe to find themselves, I did have an epiphany. You see, our next hotel was across the street from a small carnival. My five-year-old was elated. I had volunteered to take her down for a couple of hours while everyone else rested. The hotel looked out at the ocean, and while watching my kiddo ride what might have been the jankiest carnival ride in history, it really started to sink in and make a little more sense. My mom didn't want a bucket list because she wanted the list to include us. She wanted everything she did to be experienced with us, from buying couches to plane rides. She wanted to give us an unforgettable goodbye. But how do you admit to yourself, or let alone anyone else, that you're dying without being just a little bit pissed off all the time? I needed to be more understanding and patient. I couldn't ruin what little time we had left on this trip or in this life. On the drive to the Blarney Stone, my mom was almost giddy with excitement. She had been dreaming of kissing the Blarney Stone since she was a little girl. Mike pulled me aside and told me that she wouldn't be able to do it. He explained that the wait to get to the top where the stone was usually lasted an hour or two, and there was only one way up, an extremely narrow and unbalanced staircase that once you were on, you couldn't leave. There simply wasn't any room to turn around. And from all the traveling, my mom was now mainly using a wheelchair. We broke the news to her. She was defeated, but still optimistic that it would magically work out. We all agreed we'd look at the line once we got there. Maybe it wouldn't be too long. So we wheeled her over. The line was pretty long, but determined, she stood up. Then it started to rain. She sat back down. She started laughing. And for one of only three times in my life, I heard my mom meaningfully curse. Oh, fuck it. We piled back into the van and waited for my mom, or waited, sorry, waited for my wife who disappeared for a minute. When she came back, she handed my mom a chip of the Blarney Stone. Apparently, they sold them in the gift shop. For how much, I was never told. But my mom, with tiny tears in her eyes, gave it a smooch. Our last day was spent in Dublin. Mike dropped us off at Trinity College, a long tour my mom would never be able to handle. And then he kept my mom and my kiddo behind and took them on a search for iced coffee. He'd also prepped the day to take my mom to places specific to her family heritage, even stopping at a vacuum store named McKeon's. This was my mom's maiden name. She talked to the owner of the store for an hour. When Mike picked us up from Trinity College, he looked completely beat. Your mother's quite a lady. She tuckered me out, and that's not easy to do. Oh, I know, I said. She'll talk your ear off. She's special, he said. Reminds me of my mother. Come to find out later that Mike and my mom had a long day of heart-to-hearts, including long conversations about both their divorces, kids, dogs, and how they'd come out the other side best friends. The next day, we left for the airport airport. We said our goodbyes to Mike. We gave big hugs and tipped him so much money I think it was legally just another paycheck. (laughs) Leaving was so tough, mainly because none of us wanted to. After days of bickering and fighting, my mom constantly getting irritated and us irritated with her, we had finally just let it all go. For the last three days, we'd reached an incredible and perfect groove on our trip, and leaving now was just plain shite. On the flight, Reality flooded back as I saw my mom start talking to herself. Full conversations, kind of loud, to the point where the flight attendant asked if she was okay. I knew that the cancer and the chemo and everything in between had severely changed my mom, but I wasn't prepared for how severely. And when you've grown up with an absolute anchor of a human who dedicated their entire life to having it together so you could succeed, you really have no understanding of what it'll be like watching them fade. It feels personal. It feels as though it's directed at you. My mom was never actually angry at us on the trip. She wasn't angry at the coffee people or the Italian woman who didn't have manicotti. The cancer had taken her away her ability to be in control, but she was still cognizant enough to know it was happening and not be able to stop it. 
She was angry at herself and didn't know why. And I was angry at her for not knowing. When we got home, one of the first things we did was take her couch shopping. It took six hours <laughs> at one store, <laughs> deciding between three couches. Her inability to make decisions and remember things only declined further, and it took us all a while to fully understand what was happening. I never truly did. But the bickering and anger we'd all felt through most of our Ireland trip was washed away and replaced with love and fondness and an overwhelming desire to go back there just for one more day with my mom. We held her wake at her house. We had an Irish jam band playing in the living room. We had Olive Garden cater and supply plenty of manicotti. We made sure dogs were allowed and we had nothing else on the agenda but to talk to each other for as long as anyone wanted. Dallas McLaughlin, everybody, give it up. <laughs>